Yeah, I'm about a minute late this morning. A, a minute late. You'll forgive that. It happens, it happens. It doesn't happen to me very often. About a minute late today. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday View. It's a minute past 11. It is Sunday, the 9th of August, 2020. It is at the BBG, certainly not the BBC, with you for about an hour, maybe a little bit longer than an hour today. Looking through the UK's Sunday newspapers and hearing from some interesting voices along the way. You can tweet the programme as usual. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. I look forward to reading your tweets as we go along. It's the BBG, not the BBC. You're listening to the Richie Allen Radio Show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yeah, a little bit late. Lots to edit, in fact. That's the reason. A lot of audio to edit this morning. I didn't think that would be the case because the mid-morning, early morning talk shows here are on hiatus because of summertime. I know these are strange times, but the politicians are on holiday and the talk show hosts are on holiday as well. But there was a lot of audio this morning. Gladly. So I was editing it feverishly right up until 11 o'clock. But I'm here now, and you're very welcome. Thanks for joining me on another very nice day here in the northwest of the UK, Salford. Of course, it is very, very nice. Now, before I go anywhere, a little bit of sad news. On Wednesday last, I we had a phone in, didn't we? You and I, and we heard from some very, very interesting people. And at the very end of it, Lorraine rang in from Surrey to tell us that her family were distressed at the fact that her brother Colin was receiving end-of-life care at a hospice and they weren't allowed to spend very much time with him at all because of COVID-19 regulations. They weren't able to basically station somebody from the family with him at all times and their access to him was very limited. It turns out that the following evening, Colin passed away at that hospice and none of the family, neither his sister Lorraine nor his sons, were with him. There was a nurse with him at the end and uh, Lorraine left me know this yesterday on uh, social media. So, first of all, even though I didn't know Colin, I, I'm, maybe you didn't know Colin, and it can sound empty, but I, d- I do mean it. Sincere condolences to everybody involved there. And by talking about it, it highlighted an issue that has come up on the programme, but we never heard from somebody whom it affected so directly. This dreadful, dreadful wickedness where people are denied the dignity of being surrounded by their loved ones in their final hours. So Lorraine, thanks for sharing that with us. And and um, yeah, I won't say any more on that. OK, let's have them um, a look through the Sunday newspapers then. Granny killing is a hot topic on UK news this morning. All about Preston. That's a town in the northwest. A city, a town. We'll talk about that in a short while. Before that, though, we'll we'll run very quickly through the front pages of the newspapers. And things have been so mental this morning that I'm still uploading stuff as I speak with you. I really am. Because um, I didn't even get time to load music. And I didn't load all of the audio into the playout system. It doesn't often happen. I said to myself this morning about six o'clock, there won't be much to do audio-wise on account of, um, as I said earlier on, things being a bit quieter on the old media. But um, there's lots, and that's no bad thing. So, yeah, okay, right. That's what you call multitasking, what I just did there. Let's look at the front pages then of the papers. Okay, the Sunday Times front page. PM, children suffer more by staying home. I'm going to race through these. The Times, Sunday Times says Johnson has ordered a PR campaign to ensure schools reopen on time in September after being presented evidence that personal and social harm to children is more persuasive to parents than fears about failing their exams. Parents more likely to get them into school if parents believe the children are suffering emotionally and socially. Socially. Sunday Express, Boris warns no excuses. Same story. The Mail on Sunday, headline PM, it is a moral duty to reopen schools. 
Also a picture of the Queen on the front page of the Mail on Sunday. And a story about the Queen not wearing a mask on holiday at at Balmoral even. Of course, the Queen is in no danger. Lizards don't get viruses from people, or at least that's what I've heard. Anyway, boom, boom. The Sunday Mirror. We're heading for lockdown next month, says who? Says David King, that's who. He told the Sunday Mirror that the UK needed an effective test and trace system by September. Otherwise, schools opening fully again would put us right back in danger and we might have to lock down the country. This guy is an, a member of Independent Stage, a former government advisor himself, David King. He might actually be a former chief medical officer or deputy chief medical officer. The mind fails me now, but it's one or the other anyway. Sunday People headline, pubs on last orders. The paper says bars have been linked to outbreaks with a photograph showing customers apparently not socially distancing amid pleas for people to follow coronavirus rules to keep venues open. That's everywhere too. The Mail Online is running repeated story after repeated story basically complaining that people are not adhering to social distancing. Sunday Telegraph runs a story on the front page alleging that the French government wants £30 million to police the channel. If you've been watching BBC and Sky in the last 48 hours, you will not have failed to observe or notice stories about migrants crossing the channel. The right, the alt-right, the far-right having a field day with these stories. The French are saying, give us 30 million quid, mon dieu. Uh, But maybe they're not. It's just newspapers at the end of the day. The Star on Sunday leads with a hilarious story. The headline is Bronson Batters Them. Well, it's about the notorious inmate Charles Bronson. He's forced prison bosses into a U-turn after they took his favourite food, fish and chips, off the prison dinner menu. Well, it was obviously a straightforward conversation. Bronson obviously said, listen, get fish and chips back on the menu or I'll beat the granny out of every last one of you. And they said, uh... Okay, okay. That's the front pages of the papers. When we come back, we will look in depth at some of these stories, me and you and you and me. But it is a Sunday. We are going to be a bit more relaxed this morning. So here's the chairman of the board himself kicking off the program. It's the chairman, Frank Sinatra. I've got you under my skin. Lovely tune this. Back with more news in about two minutes time. Lovely tune, Frank Sinatra, Francis Albert on the Richie Allen Radio Show. Sunday morning, wake up if you're lying in bed. Get up out of them feathers. As the amazing Tony Weldon used to say on Waterford Local Radio on Sunday mornings for many years. I miss that man. I only knew him briefly. Great radio presenter. Used to do a Sunday morning show playing big band music and doing dedications for senior citizens and their families. Wonderful stuff. God be with the days. And his catchphrase, was, his catchphrase was, get up out of them feathers. Tony Weldon, top man. Now, big story in the Times, in the Mail, and everywhere else today, and that is an Ipsos Mori poll. That's a polling company, don't you know? An Ipsos Mori poll shows that more and more people are unlikely to have the old vaccine. <laughs> Yes, yes, a lot of people reluctant to have the vaccine. Let's hear from Sky reporter Sam Holder. Tell us all, Sam, what's going on? It shows, first of all, that 53% of people say that they would be certain to or very likely to accept a vaccine. But so 53% said they'll have it. One in six say that they'd be unlikely to or definitely won't. And it appears uh, that there is perhaps unsurprisingly, a link between belief in conspiracy theories... Ah, here we go with the old conspiracy theories. ...and potential rejection of a vaccine. Uh, About 34% of people with that viewpoint believe that face masks are potentially dangerous and are being used by the government to control the population. Wow, you'd have to be off your tits mad, wouldn't you, to think that face masks are potentially dangerous and that the government are using them 
to control the population. I mean, you'd have to be mad to think that, even though every scrap of evidence that's available to every human being on planet Earth proves that is the case. The masks are dangerous. Ridiculous walking around in this heat with a mask on you. Anyway... Age is also an important factor. Those between 18 and 34 are twice as likely uh, to say that they probably wouldn't get a vaccine if it became available. Com- Isn't that brilliant? Isn't that brilliant? If you're between 18 and 34, you're twice as likely to say you wouldn't have it. Get in. Compared to those aged between 55 and 75. So it's all bad news then for the agenda for the elite. This is not good. So what do we do? At the speed of light, get an expert on quick to tell us that we are a bunch of selfish bastards and that we are putting everyone else at risk. So that's what they did. Immediately after Sam's little report, we heard from Danny Altman, an immunologist at Imperial College in London. I think it's desperately worrying. I mean, it's, it's a small survey, but it resonates with other surveys I've seen around the world. And the idea that nearly half wouldn't um, will be desperate for our current situation if it, if it was borne out. Uh, just explain to us, because you're an immunologist. So let's let's say let's fast forward and say there is a vaccine available. How much of the population needs to be vaccinated? Exactly. So you know we're all in this together, and the the rough calculation is that we need strong protective immunity in about sixty percent of the population for this thing to really be got rid of and for life to go back to normal. If just- we're saying that you know, about 50% of the population aren't sure if they want it or not. Um, that puts all of us in a, in a terrible risk of, of just carrying on with the situation ad nauseum. Hey, hey, that puts us all at a terrible risk. We're all at a terrible risk if people don't have the vaccine. Carrying on ad nauseum. Ah, uh, Danny, boy. Right, go through the uh, gears then, Danny. Ramp the fear up. We're all living out this terrible um, dystopian existence at the moment that we know. Oh, this is amazing. We're all living out a terrible dystopian existence. Well, we are. But why? That is the $64 million question. Is it because there's a virus that is hell-bent on killing us all? Or is the dystopian existence because people have taken advantage of an otherwise fairly harmless virus to bring about a paradigm that they have, well, they've had wet dreams about for years. Love the way he starts this. We're all living out this terrible um, dystopian existence at the moment. Yes, we are. That we never dreamt of. And oh, some of us dreamt of it now. And we need an escape strategy. Now, this is lovely. We need an escape strategy. We need an escape strategy from this dystopian nightmare. This is an Imperial College London immunologist speaking now. And this is a virus that lives in people's lungs and and gets transmitted really quite readily. Lives in our lungs. And the only escape route we have... Go on. ...is if... Vaccines? If we we block off the path of transmission... Block off the path of transmission, Danny. And how do you do that? Through the calculation says having about 60%... Yes, 60% vaccinated. ...of the population carrying (laughs) protective antibodies and T-cells such that it no longer has a pool of people to transmit to. If 50% of people, because of, of, of stuff that they've, they've enjoyed on the internet, aren't going to join in with us, they're going to wreck it for us. They're going to wreck it! <laughs> We're all living out this... I love it. If 50% of people, because of things they enjoy on the internet, don't join in with us, well, they're just going to wreck it for everybody. Imagine. People, because of, of, of stuff that they've, yeah. they've enjoyed on the internet, aren't going to join in with us, they're going to wreck it for us. <laughs> Oh, Danny boy, the lies, the lies are damning. This fecker knows that he has just, well, coughed up, vomited forth, uh, basically a a pool of of crap, of poo on national television. He doesn't care. Because all of his friends are doing it too. There's nobody to contradict him. Ah, we're going to wreck it. So what's going on with these conspiracy theories, Danny? My understanding of some of the conspiracy theories are based often on a misunderstanding of this thing called adjuvants. So that's the thing that um, adjuvants are the thing that in some vaccines go in with the vaccine to enhance their effect. It's hard for me to understand how people could be against these vaccines because we don't know which ones they are yet. And nearly all of them don't use adjuvants. Maybe you've just given him the answer, maybe. (laughs) Maybe. 
don't know which ones they are yet, and nearly all of them don't use adjuvants. Well, that's a lie. So I'm wondering if the conspiracy theories have led them astray. Um, and, you know, and all I would say to them is, you know, think of your jobs, think of your kids going to school, think of your relatives in care homes, and think of trying to do the right thing to protect them. Try to do the right thing to protect other people. Have the vaccine. Spoke about this at length on Friday. The paradigm used to be countries. They've shifted this now to individuals. Used to be countries were entitled to sovereignty. Then they said countries couldn't have sovereignty because countries might be doing things to impact on the rest of the world. India burning coal, China burning coal, so on, so on, so on, so on. Now it's the same with human beings. Used to be that we would only interfere with you if you were murdering people or stealing from people or kidnapping people. If you were not breaking obvious laws, we would leave you alone. But not anymore. Not anymore. Because by not having the vaccine now, you're committing a crime. You are harming other people. You see? So you're going to have to have it. Adjuvants are all right, he said. And most of them now don't have adjuvants. That's, a, that's such a monstrous lie, I don't know where to begin. Aborted fetal cells, making cannibals of people. Samarosol, mercury, aluminium, all capable of breaching the blood-brain barrier. Deadly dangerous. So you can stick your adjuvants up your arse, Danny. And your lies. And your propaganda. Another college, another university that is up to its neck in terms of its, 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 its association with the Bill Gates Foundation and not only Gates Foundation, but the spin-off companies therein as well. This guy is horribly compromised. He's not telling you what he thinks. He's telling you what his Lord and Master thinks. Wants you to think. Mad stuff. Preston then, and grannies. This is interesting because Preston is only around the corner from, from here. In the northwest, Preston and grannies. Grannies, of course, remember. Enjoy yourself and kill a granny is the answer. And this is very interesting because when Buckman said that four or five weeks ago, I grabbed it. We had a good laugh at it, but now it's coming home to roost. Here's Sky News, Stephen Dixon introducing the story about grannies in Preston. Good morning to you. This is Sky News at Breakfast. Now, one of our main news stories today is about police and public health officials enforcing local lockdowns in Preston. And they're now targeting young people specifically to try to stop the spread of COVID-19. Now, about half of the new infections in the Lancashire city are amongst under 30s, a rise that officials are putting down to more gatherings in homes and in pubs. Well, let's talk to Peter Moss, Deputy Leader of Preston City Council. Good morning to you. Um, you you've, um, because of the, the demographic you're talking about here, you've come up with a slogan of, of don't kill granny. Well, it's eye-catching. Is it going to work? <laughs> it's certainly eye-catching, don't kill granny. Is it going to work then? Let's hear Peter Moss, one of the... Um, is he Deputy Leader, is he? I can't remember now. In Preston Council, is he? We'll find out in a minute. Here he is. Will it work then? Don't kill Granny. Hey, good morning, Stephen. Um, well, we hope so, absolutely. Um, clearly, uh, the, the demographics, as you say, have changed. Um, it is around more the uh, working age and younger people uh, who seem to be contracting the virus. Um, and what we're really keen, obviously, is to ensure that, that message gets out there to, to those younger people and to ensure that, that, that they are, in effect, protecting Granny. Um, we're trying desperately uh, hard within Preston, with our partners, with the police, uh, with the uh, Director of Public Health, to ensure that, that we protect the, the residents of Preston. Um, and, and the way to do that is through the younger people, because clearly that is where the, the evidence shows that um, the people are, are, are becoming uh, infected with the virus. Mm, those selfish younger people. How dare they go out together, have a bit of a dance, a few beers, a bit of hippie crack. And then come home and kill a granny. How dare they? And this is everywhere this morning. Again, funny that Buckman said this weeks ago. We get a giggle out of it. And now it's kind of catching on. More on this from TV personality Anne Diamond. Oft, um, well, if you're old enough, you'll remember Anne Diamond from TV AM with Nick Owen. Now she does the papers on Sky at weekends. More on the Preston story and Diamond on Sky this morning. I mean, this is Preston where they've got, to, if you like, a mini lockdown because there's been a, a, a spike in cases. Um, and the local authorities have actually looked at the cases. And as you see there, it says that half of the new COVID cases are 
for people under 30. And they're really worried that young people locally aren't getting it. They're, they're not getting how serious the whole matter is. In fact, the new restrictions which curb um, you mixing in pubs and uh, even in gardens or anything, they're trying to st basically stop people getting together again. Um, and uh, they've uh, they brought those restrictions in at midnight on Friday. Um, but apparently there's really no sign that anyone's taking it seriously at all. And the pubs and cafes and everything were chock-a-block yesterday. So um, the local local authority, the, uh, the chief uh, of their public health, has said, uh, gone on record saying, young people, if you, if, you, if you don't watch the restrictions, you could kill your own granny. And he's actually said that, <laughs> don't kill granny. And that seems to be a slogan that he's hoping will actually get through to this young generation that, he is really, really scared and not taking it seriously at all. Yeah, it's a slogan we hope will get through to the younger generation. We have the rule now, the precedent. Want to go out? Remember. Don't kill granny. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Little Mix are playing, are they? At Manchester Arena, you can go if you want, but... Don't kill granny. Don't kill granny. Do not kill granny. Leave granny alone. Unless granny has got an enormous amount of money and you are named in the will. That's the only time. And there, there are easier ways to kill Granny than with COVID, to be honest with you. Fluffing Granny's pillows up and accidentally leaning on her for four and a half minutes. That's the way. Michael Booker on Kill Granny slogan. He's the editor of the Sunday Express. Um, but I think slogans have worked. I think so, some slogans have worked a bit too well. You know, the stay at home uh, message. Uh, you can see the government's uh, had a bit of a problem getting people to get out of their homes since then because they scared everyone so much in the early stages. Um, yeah, it, what, was that? what was that again, Michael? That was very good. Uh, had a bit of a problem getting people to get out of their homes since then because they scared everyone so much in the early stages. Yeah, slogans were not great early on. That's very good. But rather than continue on that theme... Sadly, he endorses this killer granny nonsense. Um, it, this just reminds me that the message, I mean, the message hasn't really changed that much. And obviously Preston have slightly tweaked it. But I remember doing a front page as we were coming to the height of the pandemic back in, I think it was around about Mother's Day. In fact, it was the Mother's Day edition of the Sunday Express. And the headline was, for your mother's sake, stay at home. That's what Boris Johnson yeah. was saying then. It's, again, it's common sense. Uh, there's a, there's a, certain bunch of young people, not all of them. There is a certain bunch of people who don't have common sense. They are flouting the rules a little. They are flying a bit too close to the wind. And it's good to remind them every now and again. But let's say there has been this thread all the way through it is usually common sense. Don't put anyone yes. else at risk, particularly those older, those more vulnerable. Yes, give up your fucking lives. Give up any joy, happiness you might have because, you know, your happiness might kill some older person. And they talk about mixed messages, don't they? It's very funny. They talk about mixed messages. So they're given two different messages to youngsters. Two. And they're fairly straightforward. The first one is, right? Enjoy yourself and kill a granny is the answer. Or? Don't kill granny. Enjoy yourself and kill a granny is the answer. Or? Don't kill granny. Well, make your fucking minds up. We can either enjoy ourselves and kill granny, or we don't kill granny. Anyway, I wasn't endorsing granny aside. I don't know if there's... You've got matricide, patricide. Is there an adjective to describe killing granny? Is there? Granny aside, I have no idea. Granny aside, that's a game of football played twice a year by grannies on a five-a-side pitch. Granny aside. I have no idea what's going on. And I despair, I really do, that outside of Peter Hitchens, that nobody has come along and said, hang on a second, really. Surely, if you do really believe it is a nasty thing going around, that you would actually tell Granny, Hey, Granny, stay the fuck indoors for a, for a little while. All right? Look after you. Vitamin D, vitamin C, the usual. Bit of zinc, bit of zinc, Granny. Bit of zinc. We'll get your soaps on for you and all of that. Misogyny. And we'll go out and do what we normally do and we'll do it that way. But no, no. Everybody else has to give up their lives. Their lives. It's 27 minutes past the hour. It's Sunday View with me, Richie Allen. Live on Salford's only independent news radio network. That's my one. Uh, Richie Allen Radio. And live right now on Fab Radio 2 in Manchester. Triggerwarning.tv. Lots of other platforms as well. A lot of people taking the programme without permission. I've noticed of late. Not even the decency to say, Richie, do we mind if we stream your programme? Not even the decency. They just go and do it anyway. 
Why would you mind that, BBG, you might ask? Well, well, there's a million reasons. I'm not going to get into it. So I won't. There you go. It's nice to be asked, isn't it? Eh? I mean, you go to the trouble of presenting and producing a professional radio programme, right? It, it takes 15, 16 hours a day. And you would like to think that somebody wouldn't just take it, run it on their own website, advertise it for themselves, and not even tell you. But that's the way it is in this crazy world we live in today. Good morning, Patricia. Good morning to Stuart, whose birthday is today. I'm reliably informed. Happy birthday, Stuart. How you doing, pal? Hi to Liz Jones, to Susan, to Stephen Hardy. None of you too impressed with the guy Altman from Imperial College London. You're properly cheesed off by Altman telling us that we're going to wreck it. If we don't have the vaccine, we're going to wreck it for everybody else. And of course, this is the theme they plan on pursuing in the coming months. And they will conclude, so they will, that nobody should be allowed to wreck it for anybody else. The minority should not be allowed to wreck it for everybody else. Public health, you see, you've got to do your bit, you see. It's all coming down the line, you see. You and I know this, you see. Here's music from Ray Charles. Yes. Well, it was music from Ray Charles. Should we try that again? No? Ah, come on, Ray. Ah, it's more like it. Oh, Jesus. This track just won't play for me. Let's try it again. No, it's not happening. No, it's not happening. It is happening. Nothing is working. And of course, ironically, I was just talking about being professional only 45 seconds ago. Something will always bite you on your big hairy arse. Ray Charles, back with more on Sunday View in two minutes. Ray Charles! Did you ever see the Jamie Foxx biopic of Ray Charles? It's very, very good. Jamie Foxx is brilliant in it. Great film. If you want to check it out, if you haven't seen it before. Are you going on holidays this summer season? Are you? Are you? Well, if you are, you need to listen very carefully to this report from Sky News this morning about your halls. It's all getting a bit mad. Millions of us are going on a summer holiday in Britain after coronavirus and quarantine stopped most foreign travel. But there is concern that we're forgetting social distancing and COVID-19 restrictions when we travel around the UK. Joining me now is Alistair Handyside from the Southwest Tourism Alliance. Alistair, good morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm just having a look through the, uh, the list of guidance from the NHS. It's extraordinary. Before travelling, make sure you know where the nearest drive-through test centre is located. Before travelling, make sure you know where the nearest drive-through test centre is located. This is Britain in 2020. Going on holidays, are you? Make sure before you travel, you know where the nearest drive-through test centre is. Because you might need a test. To guidance from the NHS, it's extraordinary. extraordinary. Before travelling, make sure you know where the nearest drive-through test centre is located. <laughs> Remember to pack hand sanitizer and face coverings and any medication you may need. It's, it's really interesting, isn't it, how just our lives have changed so extraordinarily in five or six months. Interesting, she says. Isn't it interesting how, extraordi- uh, how extraordinarily our lives have changed? Is she mad? What kind of fuckery is this? You a bit mad, love? You a bit mad? Going to the south coast, are you? Make sure you know where those testing centres are located. Anyway, what does Alistair Handyside? Love these surnames in the UK. Alistair Handyside from the South West Tourism Alliance. What does he think about these interesting times and about going on holidays? Alastair. Several things to consider. One is that uh, tourist destinations are working on much reduced capacity because of social distancing, so there's less accommodation available. So you must book before you go. You won't find anything last minute unless you book before you go. When you when you arrive, you need to make sure that you really do avoid the really crowded spots that get highlighted uh, on programmes uh, such as Sky. You know, there are beaches not very far away from those crowded beaches, which are much less crowded. There are moors not very far away from the very crowded parts that you moors <laughs> that you could spread out to. So please come to Cornwall, walk on the moors. Please book before you uh, uh, leave to go on holiday. Make sure you've got somewhere to go. Book your restaurants. Book your cafes, book your visitor attractions. It's all online. And, and then you can make sure you have a really good spread out socially distanced holiday. You can have a really good spread out socially distanced holiday. Marvellous. 
Follow the NHS guidance and plan, he says. We're urging people to not only take the NHS advice and know what to do when you're on holiday, and we cover that in a second, but to make sure you plan your holiday. If you plan your holiday, you'll have a great one. If you don't plan your holiday, you, you, you won't have such a good holiday and your memories won't be that great. <laughs> That is sage advice, that isn't it, from Alistair there. Plan your holiday, you'll have a great one. Don't, and you won't have a great one, and your memories won't be that great. Fantastic stuff. Sunday view it is, 24 minutes to midday, this Sunday, 9th of August, 2020. Renowned healer Mark Bayerski travels the world to find the most unique and powerful crystals for self-healing. Since the ancient times, crystals have been used as healing tools. They hold a natural healing vibration and are highly charged in positive energy. Mark teaches how to channel the universal energy and transfer it to the crystal to activate its healing power. Each crystal is used for its unique ability to target a different physical or emotional challenge. Mark Bayerski is an author, healer, speaker, and founder of the Pure Energy Healing Academy. He shares powerful messages of inspiration and healing on his daily YouTube videos, reaching millions worldwide. Mark's crystals, healing oils, and incense sticks are most sought after by other healers. His collection is available online at www.markbayerski.com. His work is presented through Lemon House a company that creates and curates consciously made gifts. 23 and a half minutes to the top of the hour. Sunday View, live from Salford. It is absolutely glorious today. It's been a glorious weekend. Thunderstorms on the horizon Monday, Tuesday, they're telling us. Let me give you a quick heads up, re, re or via my uh, holiday. I'm working, of course, this coming week till Thursday, as I normally do. And then I'm away for two weeks, the last two weeks in August. And generally take my holiday this time of year. I'll be back with you on Tuesday, September 1st, I believe. And Monday's a bank holiday, of course, the August bank holiday weekend. So this coming week, packed week of guests and shows. We might even squeeze a phone in in there as well. And then I'm away for a couple of weeks. And I'm uh, looking forward to the break. I need a break now. Although I'm in fine fettle. I need to get out. I need to get out. Don't we all? I need to have a lovely socially distanced holiday is what I need. Right, let's uh, move swiftly on. Hi to Paul McNairn. How you doing, Paul? Paul says, a question for your audience. What will be the catalyst that will force the people to resist this obviously nefarious narrative re-COVID-19? I don't know that my listeners have the answer to that, Paul. Because lots of things have happened in recent years. Lots of incredibly fascistic things. Draconian things. And every time something happens... I know that we haven't had anything like this, but we have had this, Paul, and, well, people are happy to go along with it. They're happy to wear the masks. They're happy to shout at other people in supermarkets and shops to tell them to wear the masks. They're happy to, to, to have the vaccine when it arrives. I don't know if there ever will be a catalyst that will light a fire under enough people that they will come together to do something about it. I don't know is the answer. I don't know if my audience know, but if they do know, they can tweet the programme. Be happy to hear from them this morning, as usual. Let's uh, move on then. Let's move on. So the kids then going to school in September. Children supposedly going back to school in a few weeks' time. All over the media. Because the Prime Minister Boris Johnson says it must happen. Teachers, unions say, well, we're not happy. We don't think it's a safe environment. Should kids wear a mask and all that jazz? Okay, and that was... The topic on BBC Breakfast News this morning and also on Sky. Uh, should they wear a mask? What will it be like? Will it be okay for children to go back to school? Here's a GP called Zoe Norris. She's a GP and she has her own children and she was on Sky News. Oh, I, I think it's really challenging. I think I, uh, my children are 8 and 10 um, and so their understanding is relatively good. Um, but the eight-year-old particularly is going to struggle to to follow any particular social distancing or um, or distance from her friends. Um, I think it depends what the reality is like in the classroom. Uh, I'm not a teacher, and I suspect trying to corral 30 or so children um, into following procedures is going to be really difficult. 
Yeah, I mean, there's been also lots of discussion this morning about whether children, especially older children, secondary school age, should have to wear face masks in the classroom. The moment the government's saying that's not required. Um, yeah, the government is saying at the moment, but watch this space, it isn't a requirement for secondary school students to wear a mask. But in the UK's newspapers today, and again on breakfast television news, there are many people calling for secondary school students to wear a mask while in class to protect their older teachers. There are many people asking for this, right? So what does she say? They're talking about hand washing in the classroom and other... Hand washing in the classes. ...preventative measures, social distancing. As a parent, as a doctor, where, where do you sit on face masks in the classroom? Yeah. Um, I think it's another example where the messaging is, is a little bit muddled. So we know that if you go out to a supermarket, if you're over 11, you have to wear a face mask, preferably. Um, but we're saying that we're not going to do that in schools. So I would be really happy if my children were older for them to be wearing face masks in school. I don't have an issue with that. She's got no problem with her children wearing masks in school if they were a bit older. I think it's very much becoming normal now for all of us. Not really, love. Um, and while you can wash your hands as much as you like, if you are speaking out loud, if you are... Tw oh, here we go again. Wash your hands as much as you like, but you might be speaking out loud. You might be answering questions. You are speaking out loud, if you are talking loudly, answering questions perhaps, and obviously then coughing or sneezing, you are going to be more likely to transmit aerosols. So, uh Aerosols. <laughs> I think it's perhaps something that we may see changing in the next few months. Wow. Kids are not kids. Children are not children anymore. They are little aerosol atomic bombs that can kill us all. This is how children are to be seen now. As little time bombs going around with virus and germs that could kill everybody. Get masks on them. Ultimately, of course, they want them in the house. Learning from home. Locked into a a living room and being taught online and eventually that teaching will be done by artificial intelligence. This is true, none of this is my fanciful musings, my fanciful imagination, you know, we know this is true, their own paperwork says this, their own documents. Ah oh, well. What about the virologist and podcast host Chris Smith? The BBC loves him on the very same programme, on Kiddies wearing masks in school. Thankfully, Smith is not too keen on the idea, thankfully, at least on this issue. As a member of the NHS, I'm, when I'm at work, having to wear a face mask at work and, and it's deeply unpleasant. I can't understand sometimes what my colleagues are saying to me. They can't understand what I'm saying to them. And I've been watching my colleagues, actually, uh, and they subconsciously are fiddling with these face masks all the time because they're uncomfortable, especially in the heat we've been experiencing. And that means that actually that there may be a downside to wearing these face masks because although they cut down the droplet spread from an individual, and that's how we think they may work to mitigate a bit the spread of infection, actually when you start touching them and adjusting them, then you can be putting infection back onto them, but also taking anything off of them onto your fingers, which you then put into your eyes or in your nose and your mouth. So, you know, you, you've got to weigh these sorts of things up. And I think when the, when the children are at school, this could be a very, very big distraction, especially for smaller kids, especially initially. And we need to be prepared for how we're going to handle that. Mm. All right. Yeah, good. He gave a very good. He gave he gave good analysis there of the problems with mask wearing. That was good. He was observing his own colleagues. But then he was asked about the trade-off. What about the trade-off? In order to open schools, we might close bars and restaurants. What about the trade-off? It's all about chains of transmission. The more contacts there are between people, the more opportunities there are for things to spread. Now, it's not a given they will spread, but you're just maximising the number of pathways or increasing the number of pathways or conduits through which chains of transmission can flow. So... If you therefore minimise those conduits or reduce them wherever possible, you reduce the chance of transmission. And so that's where these trade-offs come in, that if we think about the, the whole of society as a burden of disease, then we're willing to tolerate a certain burden of disease as long as we can keep it monitored, keep it under control, up to a point. And therefore, we can 
adjust the, the formula, as it were, so that we can have that amount of disease we're willing to tolerate in some sectors of society and not in others. And so the idea of a trade-off is what, if we know that people socialising is one route through which vi viruses can spread, then if we reduce that, we, it gives us a bit more flexibility, a bit more room to manoeuvre to enable schools to function. And I think most people will argue that trading off the pub and the restaurants against allowing children to return to their education it is probably a reasonable compromise at this stage. Imagine that. Most people would, would, would agree, he says, that trading off pubs and restaurants, closing them to give kids the chance to go to school, well, that's the right thing to do. Most people would agree with that. What about those children whose parents work in hospitality? Anyone? 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 Hello? What about the children whose parents work in hospitality? Several million people in this country are employed in hospitality. Will those kids be able to go to school when their parents are potless? That's the question. 14 minutes to the top of the hour. Sunday view. Another tune. Yes. Here's the Mavericks. All you ever do is bring me down. Three, four. Yeah, one of the best nights out the future Mrs. Allen and myself ever had in our lives was going to see the Mavericks at the Apollo in Ardwick. At the Apollo in Ardwick. Uh, about three and a half years ago. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Ever. I'll never forget the energy. Um, we were three, four rows from the front. Raul Mallow and the Mavericks. Two hours, 20 minutes of music like that. The accordion, the brass section, the double bass. If you ever get a chance to see the Mavericks, if they ever come to a town anywhere near you, not only is Raul Mallow one of the greatest singers in the world today, he really is a genuine tenor. There is no good time band like the Mavericks anywhere. I'll never forget dancing around that night. Shamelessly. It's great to be in a room with other 30 and 40, 40 somethings. And you can dad dance the bejesus out of the place. Dad danced the bejesus out of the place and everybody else is doing the same. No shame in it, is what, I, is what I'm saying. Ten minutes to midday. Your Richie Allen radio show, Sunday View, live from Salford. This great city, this great historical city. Marvellous. All right then, do you want to know where all this is going? It's where we've thought and prophesied that it might be going. Ever since we were told we'd have to lock down. And ever since we heard about health passports and digital passports. Yeah. Mm. This is where it's all going. Digital health passports are in development around the world. But there is a company in Manchester. It's doing very well. And it seems to be, at least in the UK anyway, ahead of the game. They've developed a V health passport. Developed in Manchester, Manchester University. And Mike Tyndall is a former England rugby player. He's married to one of the royal family, a cousin of, of Harry and William, Zara. She's an equestrian, yes, Zara Tyndall. Well, she's Zara Tyndall now. Zara Phillips she used to be. Mike Tyndall, former World Cup winner, went to Sail Sharks in Greater Manchester to get a COVID test and to have the result uploaded onto his V health passport. Have a listen to some of this. Came across this over the weekend. Also, Charlotte in Burnley came across this and sent this to me earlier on. But I had come across it because I'm on the lookout for V health passport news. And I came across this myself. Thank you, Charlotte, anyway, in any case. Here's Mike Tyndall off to Sail Sharks to get a test and to have the result of the test uploaded to his V Health passport, yeah. I'm here today at Sail Shark to check on how the boys are doing, but also get a COVID-19 test uh, through Lattice Healthcare and then upload that to my V Health passport. We're here today at Sail Sharks to do some uh, rapid testing for COVID-19. The nurse just takes a uh, finger prick with the lancet of the patient, in this case, Mike's. Be gentle. <laughs> Very nervous. Uh, finger and just to draw a droplet of blood onto He's the having the blood tip. taken. A couple of drops of blood. A couple of drops. He's added. If there are any uh, antibodies within the blood sample, it will identify those by activating the test <laughs> lines. Lovely. Bit of pain. <laughs> Little bit of pain. Once the test result comes through, the nurse will then update the V Health Passport. Very important. So once the test result comes through, 
the nurse then using a computer will upload his V Health passport, which is contained on an app on his phone. Get it? It's pretty simple. It will identify those by activating the test lines. And then? A bit of pain. <laughs> you get the result, very important. Once the test result comes through, the nurse will then update the V Health passport and that will update Tom's COVID status on his app. The V passport is now valid for two weeks. The V passport is valid for two weeks, said the nurse. Okay, which will show that you're um, negative. You're negative now. Now, anybody that needs to validate Mike's health status can simply scan his passport from a safe distance. Again, very important. So anybody who feels like they need to validate Mike's passport can do so from a safe distance by using a device that can read it. Negative. Now, anybody that needs to validate Mike's health status can simply scan his passport from a safe distance and it gives his validation. It gives his validation. So from a distance, you can point your device at Mike. Mike's phone might be in his hand. It might be in the arse pocket of his jeans. It doesn't matter. You point your device, ding, it will tell you that Mike has tested negative for COVID. So Mike, presumably can come inside and, I don't know, have something to eat, watch a film, get on a plane, whatever you can think of. Have a listen to the guy who invented this, the CEO, uh, who doesn't have much to say except this, and this is important, the guy who invented it. Hi, Lewis James Davis, CEO and founder of VST Enterprises. COVID-19 testing paired with a V Health passport is key to getting fans back into a stadium safely. Ah, yeah, it's lovely that, isn't it? Just in case you missed it. ST Enterprises. COVID-19 testing paired with a V Health passport is key to getting fans back into a stadium safely. COVID health testing. So COVID health testing, you get tested for it, combined with a V Health passport, is key to getting fans back into stadiums safely. And the chief executive of the Premier League is in agreement with this idea. One of the ways we can get people back into stadiums and back into concert venues, you name it, is if they get their digital health passport and get their COVID tests regularly. Because as the nurse said, it only lasts for two weeks. Right? And this is the future. This is the coercion that we've talked about quite a lot on the programme. The coercion. It won't be a case of you must have the vaccine. They're not that stupid. Well, they are. But they're not that brave to say you must have the vaccine. No, they don't need to. They don't need to say you have to have the vaccine. Haven't had it, no? Well, I'm sorry. No 99 for you from the ice cream truck today. No. No go-kart trip for you. No paintball trip for you and the kids. No, you can't take the children to the beach. Oh, but the beach is out. It doesn't matter. You haven't shown the rest of us that you're on board, that you're on the team and that you care enough about your fellow man to have the test and to have the passport displayed. So you'd best stay at home until you come to your senses. That's where we're going with it, sadly. And, yeah. I was going to be a bit churlish and talk about... But I'm not going to. Because, look, when people go out and about, I admire them. I really do. I understand, and and, and I promoted it, I mentioned it several times and I tweeted it several times. People meeting around the country on Saturday. And it's laudable. I would never criticise anybody for doing it. But I just don't think those who are pushing this agenda, I just don't think they give a shit really. Personally, I really don't. It's going to take people coming together on streets. You're presupposing, you know, when you're getting strangers to come from different parts of the country to meet in London. You're presupposing that that's going to set off some chain reaction. When I would say it has to be ultra local in order to make a difference. It's got to be your neighbours and the people on the street that you live in. You're going to have to engage with those people and come together with those people before you start making any change in terms of putting the frighteners on those who would subject us to this tyranny. And it is a tyranny. You heard them there. You heard the guy from the Premier League last week. Yep, looks good to us. Fans can start returning to the grounds if 
they take the test and if they if they upload it to their COVID passport. But of course the key here is the key is the test only lasts for two weeks. So how do we get around that? The vaccine. That's how we get around that. Get the vaccine and you won't have to have your COVID test every two weeks. I've been Richie Allen. That was Sunday View. Thanks for listening to it. Hope you have a good Sunday. Look after yourselves and one another. I'll be back with you tomorrow at 5 o'clock for Monday's programme. Until then, leaving you with Moz.